to another Fresh Fiction Video Book Club. I'm Samantha T, and today's guest author is Zen Cho, here to talk about her recent release, The Friend Zone Experiment, a new rom-com. Zen, thanks you so much for joining us. It's great to see you today. Thanks so much for having me. Let's get some things started. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and how did you first get started writing? So I live in the UK. I'm currently in Malaysia, which is where I'm from. I grew up here and so I'm here visiting family, but I usually live in the UK. And I got started writing, and I'm better known for fantasy actually, I got started writing original fiction in my mid-twenties, actually when I started working as a lawyer. And, and I had this job, I, I was quite lucky in that I qualified right after the 2008 crash and I was looking two ways. Firstly, I still had the job which wasn't guaranteed necessarily, but it was really quiet. The markets were really quiet because of the recent crash. And what that meant was I could log off at a normal time by the standards of, of legal practice. And I was going home at like six, seven o'clock. And I started thinking, I sort of thought to myself, is this all there is to life? And I'd always wanted to be a writer and always been interested in that. So I started writing the first short stories and then they got published in a relatively small way, sending them to magazines and so on. And actually they were collected and they were released for the first time in the UK last year as a collection called Spirits Abroad. But the collection was published about 10 years ago in Malaysia and it's had a fairly winding publication journey. But I started writing those and then I started writing novels. And so I've written, I published three novels before this, but they were all fantasy, albeit different genres. I'm not very good at sticking to one genre. And this is my first contemporary romance with no speculative elements at all. And this is what I'm so fascinated looking at your writings and, and just the entire diversity across the spectrum, because it's not often you're seeing people who have really started out writing more fantasy type novels and then moving into a contemporary rom-com. What was the inspiration and did you find you had a different method as you're moving between these different genres? So the, the kind of, I've always liked um, romance. So I've, I like reading it. I most of my previous books have a kind of romantic subplot. It's just not the it's just not the primary thread, and and so in a way it felt quite natural to to write it. It wasn't part of the plan. Basically, what happened was obviously we all went through lockdown a few years ago, and I got really into K dramas. And because I'm Asian, I basically have been surrounded by people recommending K dramas. For those who don't know, K dramas are Korean dramas. It's a very popular subgenre um, internationally. And, and they're really fun. And part of the reason why they're fun is because they combine very trope-led, fun storytelling. So there's a lot of kind of fake dating. There's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of one really classic thing is where one character will stumble, the, one of the characters of the main ship will stumble and fall into the other character and they end up on the ground. And there you know, is all this kind of forced proximity and so on. But they combine all of that with a focus on character, the focus on relationship, both within the main character, between the main characters and the kind of wider community around them. So there's often a lot of attention paid to supporting characters and developing them as well, which I enjoy. And they often also tackle wider issues, like wh whether it's societal issues or what have you. And I think it's, I think that those things are things that you, you also see in genre romance a lot of the time. So it's, you know, it's women's viewing. So most K-dramas are written by women as well. And the kind of stereotypes they're watched by your aunties but I think they, that often masks the reputation masks a kind of greater depth and that's that was my gateway so I watched these and I thought these are fantastic and I wonder what it would be like to write a book that was like that that can try to navigate that kind of lightness but also the kind of substance so that's what I ended up doing and for some reason like, there are lots of genres in k-drama so there are fantasy ones as well but it, it just ended up as as non-speculative, it's kind of contemporary romance. I, I suppose as well, because at the time I was living in Birmingham with young children. So in a way, the book set in London, I lived in, in London for nine years before that. And in a way, it was a way of time traveling back to when I was a bit younger and had fewer commitments and could just spend all my time like hanging out with my friends in nice restaurants. So there are quite a few nice restaurants in the book. <laughs> And that's one of the things I really enjoyed about this novel, too. And I get the K-dramas. My dad 
busting the stereotype, he loves watching K-dramas. Heaven forbid. Yeah, no, uncles are also very into it. <laughs> and he's constantly recommending different ones to me, or he'll come over and say, okay, you've got to see this clip. And all the different versions of K-dramas, right? And you have the uh, straight contemporary or the more modern settings, but then, like you said, there's also the different fantasy ones. But it's also all those different layers that are built into the story. So it, you might look at it initially and say, oh, this is a fluff romance. But really, when you're watching it, there's all these other storylines that are going on. And with your book, The Friend Zone Experiment, that's what I was also constantly keeping track of. It's, okay, here is the initial relationship with Renee, but then it's, oh, here's the drama with her family. And where is that going? And then there were just so many different layers. Well, what happened to Stephen and what's going on there? So how did you keep track of all of these different intertwined threads as you were going through the story? So I, I, and this goes to your earlier question about whether it's different writing fantasy versus romance. What was a bit easier about writing romance, I'm not saying it's easy to write romance because it was very challenging as, as writing a novel always is, but one thing that made it a bit simpler is that you have it's very clear what the plot is, which is that it's all about the development of that main relationship between the, the two kind of leads, two or more, I should say. And there's that romantic relationship that you need to develop, right? So everything in the plot needs to feed into that and it needs to feed into the development of each individual character, bring them to the point where they, they're actually ready for love and they can actually achieve that love and, and achieve that connection with the other person. And in that way, it kind of simplifies things a bit because when you're like, oh, what do I do? What material do I, what should I keep? What should I cut? You can tell yourself, okay, focus in. Does this actually advance the relationship? Does it retard it? And, and how I conceptualize it was the main plot is obviously that development of the main romantic relationship, but then each person has their own journey. Renee has her journey with her family and Ketsung has a journey which is connected to his family, but actually not that much. Yeah, it's, it's connected to his family as well in their past and why they're, the, they're in London. So that's how I managed it. It's, it's thought of it as kind of having three strands, really. Another thing I was wondering, again, since you started with the fantasy and then moving into the rom-com, and I understand the inspiration behind that, but I don't know how else to ask this, but were you scared in moving into a contemporary rom-com? Because with your fantasies, you're an award-winning author. You've received several awards for your different fantasy stories. So having that level of recognition and honors to move into a straight uh, rom-com without those fantastical elements, were you nervous? Was it, did you ever have that? No, but you're it like, wasn't. Oh, gosh, what am I going to do here? It, it wasn't a pragmatic decision. If I wanted to make more money and gain more prestige, like staying in fantasy would have been the sensible choice. I really went into it because I started writing it really without necessarily thinking of publication. I started writing it as an escape from kind of the, the daily drudgery of, I know so many people went through this, where childcare, like the nursery was closed. I was, par me, I was parenting like a young child. My husband and I were both essentially working full-time jobs. I worked part-time as a lawyer, but then I also write, so it comes out to slightly more than full time, to be honest. And we were pulling shifts, and it was, it was very draining. And obviously, there was, there was also that kind of wider world of everything was quite scary. And so, on. writing this was my escape. So, it, I didn't think kind of technic strategically or, or, or in a career way about it at all. It was very much a kind of creative impulse. And for some reason, I don't really know, but the kind of impact of lockdown was I didn't, I needed, I wanted escapism, but I. I suddenly found that I couldn't really engage with fantasy. It was almost too much escapism and it required too much um, of an exertion of my imagination. Whereas like all the escapism I wanted was being able to imagine like jumping on a train down to London, seeing some of my friends, right? That was, that was where I was. So it wasn't scary in that sense. Once I encountered the publication process, once I had a draft and I was like, oh, maybe I should show it to my agent and so on. Yeah, that part like gets stressful, but it always is stressful. Even if I'd stayed in fantasy, it would have been stressful. So yeah. What was that reaction then when you showed your agent to go publish this, hey, this is different from what I've done in the past. Oh, she was, she's very supportive. So I think she's always liked the romantic subplots in my books. And she's, although she's very much a core science fiction fantasy agent, that's a kind of core genre. And I think the only other romance author she has writes paranormal romance, or I think she's rep like historical romance writers as well. But 
contemporary romance is a new genre for her to represent, but she's very open to it and she's very encouraging. I think we it was interesting though going out on submission because what we found was like it got turned down by quite a lot of publishers and they didn't turn it down because they thought the writing wasn't good or, or anything like that um, but the kind of common the most common comment we were getting back was that it's too serious and I think because again thinking about the moment we're in I think because of the pandemic and all the other kind of things that we've all been facing in quite a stressful world in the past few years. What I see is that readers are going through a real kind of cozy moment where they want comforting fiction. And I think Friends and Experiment is comforting in a lot of ways, but it does it does tackle kind of things like political corruption, bereavement, things like that. Um, and there's a real sense of sadness, I think, particularly in Ketsyong, the male leads storyline. And I think that's that's people were like, it's not quite where the market is at the moment. People are looking for something a bit fluffier to read. So I feel quite lucky that there was a publisher that kind of saw the potential in it and picked it up. Yeah, I don't think fluffy would have been the term I would ever use with it, no. But I did appreciate also the escapism with the story. And again, because there were so many different subplots that were still going through the storyline where it's, oh, wait, what's going on here? I was thoroughly engaged the entire time. One thing I'm also wondering, though, when you were commenting earlier with some of your fantasy that they actually published first in Malaysia, did have you found with your books that they have a different readership across the various, do you find a different readership in Malaysia versus in the UK? Is this book hitting more of the American shelves or... A good book is a good book. Yeah, it's it's always a bit difficult to assess reception as an author because actually as a traditionally published author, I should say, when you're indie and have friends who are indie, you get the full you get the full breakdown. With traditional publishing, you tend to get your royalty statements like six months, at least six months out. And it's quite it can be quite hard to assess how it's hitting. I think, so in a way, I'll only know maybe in a couple of years' time when I've gathered information, like people got in touch with me and so on. I suppose it is a different readership in that when you write in English, and I, I grew up speaking English, it's my primary and first language, and I'm not really fluent in any other language. I speak other languages, but I'm not fluent. And uh, you write in English in Malaysia, it's a minority language, essentially, but it's also it's a, it's also quite in a privileged position because like we are a former British colony and so there is there are Malaysians so there's a subsection of society where Malaysia uh, Malaysian English which is a kind of version of standard English but slightly different grammar were loan words from other languages spoken here Malay Chinese Tamil and so on but so there's a group that speaks that as their primary language but quite a small subsection population and then it's also a fairly privileged economically privileged section of the population and and then with that group obviously they're reading all the same English language books that are available in the rest of the world it's ironic but basically if you go into a bookshop here the books on the shelves are the same bestsellers on the shelves are that are on the shelves in New York and London because ultimately the big five publishers that are based out of New York and London have that distribution power and actually it's really it's really challenging for a small press in Malaysia, for example, to get their books on the shelves. In the same way that it's a challenge for small presses in the US and the UK, like distribution is a big issue, right? And it's quite rambling, but it does mean that it is a slightly different dynamic when I come back here. It's a very, it's a smaller pool. I'm better known based in, in a way. So someone, so a friend of my mum's was reading the Friends on Experiment on the kind of um, train here, like the MRT. And I think somebody spoke to her and said, oh, you're reading the new Zencho book, which just wouldn't happen on the underground in London. Yeah, it's such a big, it's such a big market in, in London. It's, it's, I'm not that recognizable in the mainstream space. In SFF, yes, but not in the mainstream space. But at the same time, it's quite a small number of people and, and arguably quite a small section of society, whereas I guess my books are more accessible to a wider range of people across different classes in the UK and the US, because it's not that, there's not the same kind of dynamics around language and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I didn't want to get into the diversity, because it always, I feel like, oh, well, why are you writing for these characters or whatever it is? No, because a good story is a good story, and that shouldn't make any difference 
all or it shouldn't make a difference that's not cor correct either because it does make a difference but i was really curious on that reception of it so it's really interesting to hear how that is different when you're in malaysia because of that different audience size and also interesting on the familiarity aspect of it um so i'm gonna have to bring up this book with some of my friends in kl and say hey have yeah this was my interview on Wednesday. So have you guys heard of her? Have you heard of her? Yeah, maybe she, they would have, though. It really depends. The other thing that I think is interesting is that the pitch can be quite different. My personal pitch for it is that it's for the book. It's a cross between the K-drama crash landing on you and the 1MDB scandal. And if I say this, like most Malaysians will be, and know exactly what they mean. Like they, even if they've not watched Crash Landing on You, which was globally very popular, they might've heard of it. They have a bit of an idea. And then anyone will, everyone will know what 1MDB means. Like they'll just know the whole, this big, like really complex corruption scandal that was really infamous. And it doesn't work in Western circles as a pitch because most people have not heard of either of those things. So the pitch in, I think my agent came up with the pitch, which is, it's like succession crossed with crazy rich agents and Jane Austen's persuasion for the kind of second romance, a uh, second chance romance element, right? But yeah, so it's quite interesting that it's like, you, you're you basically trying to translate it almost for different audiences. Wow. And, and both of those descriptions do really give me a different impression of the yeah. book. Yeah. Huh. Okay. With writing this as a, contemporary rom-com do you think you're going to go back and revisit your perilous life of jade yo do you, or is that one pretty much put to bed or yeah i don't know from time to time i think oh it'd be really nice to go back and write like sequels maybe of jade's children i had an idea that like because she's because the perilous, perilous life of jade people have read it it's a novella i wrote very early in my career actually it's self-published and it's set in the 1920s and it's about a young woman from Malaya who comes to London and she's writing articles for her living. And she writes a bad review of a very established author's book. And then they, and he's intrigued and they actually hook up. They have a liaison. But he's actually not the end game ship. <laughs> he's not the end game romance, like, where I take interest. So it's the, the closest thing I've written to romance before. Although now that I've actually written a genre romance, like a proper novel, I look at it and I'm like, oh, okay, it, it just doesn't meet the kind of the requirements of the genre, really. It's not quite a romance. But it's romance adjacent, right? And it, it has a happy ending. So in that sense, it's, it kind of hews to convention. I, because it's set in the 1920s, I've thought about before, about doing like kind of subsequent generations and looking at like, in a way, looking at Malaysia's historical development that way. But yeah, I've just never really got around to it. It's, it's like one of the things that's, oh, it'd be great to do that. And then like when I have the time at some point. Well, it came out several years ago, over a decade. So when I was pulling up the latest book on my Kindle, that one popped up because I already had it. And I was like, wait a minute. Oh, wait. I'm author. Whoa, wait. <laughs> so I wouldn't mind some follow-up novellas. That would be fantastic. <laughs> do you think you are going to want to stay in this genre? Or do you think you're going to go back to some of your other fantasy novels? Some ideal would be to be able to write both. Like, I'm not that fast a writer, so it's a bit challenging because I, with both genres, it's not like literary fiction where if you take a few years to write a novel, people don't really make a thing of it. It takes time. But with commercial fiction, which applies to both SFF and romance, it's very much the ideal is one book a year, right? If not more in, in romance sometimes. And so it's a bit, it's a bit challenging. So I've written actually a follow-up. It's not like a sequel, but it's set in the same universe broadly. So it's also about Southeast Asians. In London, it's a law firm romance. And it's about these two work nemeses who've been like running across each other. Like they're both lawyers. And they've been running across each other in like the corporate law scene in London for years. And they, at the beginning of the book, they end up sharing an office, right? And having to deal with that. And they start fake dating and so on. So it's really fun. And so I just turned that in. So I'm waiting to hear from an editor. So it will depend like how much work they think it needs but I think it's due to come out next year and but it don't it, it now means I'm out of contract so I've only contracted for two contemporary romance novels so it's an open world right now I could choose one path or the, the other I think I will write a fantasy for my next one I've had an idea in mind for the past few years and actually I've just been sitting on it because I it needs some research and I haven't had the time to do it before but my kids are a little bit older they're still very young but they're a little bit older like their sleeping has normalized a bit so it might be the time it might be the time to get grips with it but it's going to have a really strong romance element as well what I want to do is switch over to what we call our fresh fiction facts 
These are some quick rapid fire questions that hopefully an answer will come just off the top of your head, okay? Starting off with an easy one, who would you most want to be stuck in an elevator with? My, somewhat close to me. So my cousin? Okay. <laughs> what is your writing fuel? What is it that just keeps you going when you're sitting down and just pounding out the, the text? There's usually something I want to express, so that's what keeps me going. And also, life is quite boring, so I find the escapism of writing really attractive. That's what keeps me there. <laughs> I mean, other than books, because as an author, you going to have books, what is something that you own a ridiculous amount of? Oh, this is quite specific. So I am a collector of sampu, which if, if you guys know qi pao or sam, jung sam, that's a kind of traditional Chinese dress with a kind of high collar and so on. So there's a, a kind of South Chinese version of this, which is, this is actually a modern take, which is it's the jung sam top. So you've got the Mandarin collar, and then you've also got like a kind of, the attachment is like crosswise across the chest. I don't really know what the technical term for that is. But then it also comes with trousers, and it's usually a matching top and trousers. and Traditionally, this was the dress of like like older women, but there's, there's a kind of wave recently of like modernizing them and updating them and, and yeah, and making them in different fabrics and styles and so on. So like I, I collect quite a lot of these. Wow. That one's a new one for me. That one's good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I have a lot of Moomin paraphernalia. Oh, Moomin okay. by Tova Jensen. Yeah. <laughs> what luxury item can you not live without? Oh, bubble tea is probably my biggest luxury item. I probably spend, this is really shameful, but I probably spend about a thousand pounds on bubble tea every year. It's expensive. I have it very regularly. <laughs> That's why it's a luxury item, right? Yeah. <laughs> what is the craziest thing that you've ever bought online? The craziest thing? It was probably the most expensive sampoo I bought, which was actually this is related to the friends on experiment. I purchased it from a, a Singaporean designer called Ong Shin Mugam, who, a Priscilla Shin Mugam, who runs a brand called Ong Shin Mugam, and they do modern, updated versions of traditional Asian kind of dress. And it costs like I think five hundred pounds, which is the most I've spent on any single outfit. But it's absolutely beautiful, and it was it was a kind of it was a big splurge. And I can't remember what it was that I was treating myself for, but I've worn it a few times since. I, I, this is my kind of like precious item. I'm never going to spend as much money on one piece of clothing as I did on this again. Now, with something like that, though, is it one that you're like, okay, I have spent so much money on this. I want to make sure that I'm getting my money's worth and I wear it. Or would it be? I almost view it. I side. Because it's very striking, it's in this really bright print of it's a brocade, it's a silk brocade, it's a really bright print of blue orchids and a kind of green background with leaves and everything. It's very hard to wear on a daily basis. I've worn it to a few weddings, I've worn it to events, but I'll wear it to a wedding again today, but the cost per wear, it doesn't work out. I view it as a piece of art that I purchased, and the reason why it's connected to the friend zone experiment, I should say, is because Renee is a fashion designer, and she's, her business is actually inspired by Ong Shin Mugam the real life business. Who deserves to be on your Mount Rushmore of the four greatest writers? Like four greatest writers. Favorite, favorite writers, the one that have had the most impact on you, just across the industry. I think, yeah. So if I was going to put four of the ones that had a really big impact on, on me, I think, I guess I'd start with Terry Pratchett, who wrote the Discworld series, the fantasy series, because he was the first person I read where I was like, oh, you can combine like humor with with actually thinking about quite big ideas and dealing with serious issues. And like when I read him and I was like, firstly, the books are very enjoyable and very educational as well. And they're quite like, they're quite chewy. You're thinking about quite big things. Um, but at the same time, they're very accessible. They're very fun. And they gave me an example of something to aim for. Another author I would put up there is Karen Lord, the Barbadian science fiction author. She's written some fantasy as well. So she's probably best known for her first book was called Redemption in Indigo and won various awards. She's a personal fr a friend as well, but I've always been a fan. And I think, again, she has given me a model for a style of writing because she also combines that. She writes very satisfying romances, but they also have really big ideas in her books. And that's something I think that always really draws me. Um, 
who else would I put up there? Um, Naomi Novik, if you write fantasy as well. Um, I really enjoy her books. My favorite is probably Uprooted, which is a kind of um, coming of age fantasy um, inspired by kind of Polish and Eastern European folklore. Um, and it's it's great because it's got this, it's, it feels like a really classic fantasy, but it's also very fresh and again, a great romance in it. Um, and then who's who would I put as the fourth person? Maybe J.R. Tolkien, who got me into fantasy in the first place when I read Lord of the Rings at age 12. Tolkien always has a soft spot for me. That I, That's one of my earliest memories is my dad reading me from an illustrated version of The Hobbit. So oh. it starts you down that path. And it explains, I think, so much of <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to start sharing his books with my kids. Yeah. What are some of the authors that you read with your kids? What is your favorite oh, so they're... with your kids? They are very young, so they're five and two, so they're picture books. All the kind of classics, they're classic for a reason. So like Julia Donaldson, who wrote The Gruff Great, they're great books to read. Shirley Hughes, I don't know if she's as famous in the US as she is in the UK, but she does these really, she's a children's picture book for author and illustrator and they're just really, they're just, she's the most famous book for a dogger, which is about a little boy who loses his his kind of sorry toy dog at a school fair and then finds it on the kind of secondhand toys shelf but then this other little girl snipes it right she buys it before he can and she's walking away with it and his sisters won a, a huge like really fancy teddy bear and some kind of coconut shy or something comes along and negotiates with the little girl and basically I, i'll give you my brand new teddy for dogger and it's really sweet it's like it's very un- it, it's sweet but it's unsentimental it's, it, and i think what's great about her books is like the, the language is quite simple Pull. the stories are very like down to earth but the the art is it's very beautifully observed so you can you enjoy it as a child because you're like you can connect with it but you do it as an adult because you're there's such lo- affectionate depictions of the young children and yeah so they're very fam- they're very popular in the uk and yeah um, what else have i what else have i the younger ones really into flat books at the moment so we are reading one um every night that's called it's the um it's a take on billy the three billy goats gruff and, and there's a troll under the bridge so most of the books have a the most of the pages have a flat with the troll troll is hiding under it, and when you see the troll, you have to shout, "It's the troll!" So we're we're doing that every night. It's a lot of repetition. <laughs> Would you rather travel back into the past to meet your ancestors, or travel into the future and meet your descendants? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I think both would be really interesting. I think my I often write historical fiction so, or in fiction that were kind of your relationship with your older relatives or your ancestors, your forebears is really important. So there's a there's definitely an appeal in that. Except I would have to have some kind of universal translator because I prob- I couldn't speak any of the languages that my ancestors spoke, which is different dialects of Chinese. So shout out for Charlie Hughes in the chat. It's lovely. And uh, so I think I would actually travel to the future because I feel like, I guess that to a degree, the past is known, not completely, but to a degree it is known, whereas the future is not known. That would be interesting. What is your most dog-eared or reread book? The one you keep going back to? Oh, it's really hard to pick one out because I'm, I'm such a big rereader. Uh, I... The one that the one that springs to mind actually, I have this really clear mental image, and it's probably somewhere around in, in this. I'm in my parents' house in Malaysia, so it's probably somewhere at the house. It's my copy of Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. It's very old. It's one of these Penguin popular classics, the beige cover, and it's because book, especially books don't survive well in the tropical climate, so it's really faded. It's yellowed pages. It looks about a hundred years old. It's not quite that, but I have had it since I was twelve, and it's very crease fine and so on. I have reread it lots and lots of times. The most important question, where is the best place for our readers and listeners to keep up with you and find out what all you're working on? So I'm probably most active on Instagram and my handle is zenaldehyde, which is like old chemistry jokes. So aldehydes are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So like it's CHO. So zenaldehyde on Instagram or my website, zencho.org, has all the kind of proper information about books and stuff and i have a mailing list a new release mailing list where i send emails out when i've got something new that people can read and buy because i'm not very prolific <laughs> people only get an email maybe twice a year at at most so it's not a high traffic mailing list but you can sign up to that mailing list on my website dentro.org 
our time has pretty much come to an end for the recording portion, but stick around for the happy hour with our other readers. But Zen Cho, it was such a fantastic time to have you today. I really have enjoyed talking with you and everyone go check out the friend zone experiment. You will enjoy it. Thank you so much.